Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone. Over the past two and a half years, we've had close to 300 guests on our show, and all of them have been an absolute pleasure to meet and to interview. But no one has generated the intense emotional response and overwhelming outpouring of love that Tony Orlando created when he first appeared on our show a little while ago. Tony and I both believe that something magical happened during that interview because what you were witnessing was the realization by a legendary artist, possibly for the first time, of the very significant impact his career has had within the entertainment industry and for his fans. You were also witnessing the creation in real time of a deep and powerful friendship, a bonding of two hearts. Both he and I were inundated not only with thousands of comments from fans expressing just how much that interview meant to them, but with an equal number of requests that we invite him back on our show to continue that very special conversation. In fact, a number of devoted Tony Orlando fans have sent me several pages of questions they would like me to ask him. And I'm incredibly grateful that this beautiful human being has agreed to once again take the time out of his very busy concert schedule to appear on our show. And so by popular demand, I'm thrilled and very honored to welcome back to our show, my very dear friend, the super fabulous Tony Orlando. Tony, thank you so much for being here again. Harvey, I don't know how you don't look, you don't know how blessed you are. You don't know of all the interviews I've ever done in 62 years. And by the way, just to show how you have some mental telepathy going on with you. This week is my 62nd anniversary since my first record was released in 1961. Okay. Uh, March 21st is a significant date for me. March 21st, 1990, I got my star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame because it was March 21st in 61. We picked that date. And you, of all the people I've ever done an interview with, you're so right that you impacted me in a way I've never been impacted before, because I'll tell you what you did. You opened the doors to my dreams that I hadn't gone into that room since I'm a kid. When you opened the door and listed what I've accomplished, I mean, I'm grateful to God for everything that I've had in my lifetime, but to hear it from a professional who is articulate as you had an impact on me you have no idea how deeply appreciative I am of the way you approached me, spoke to me, allowed me the freedom to say what I felt, and you impacted me right to my very soul. So I want you to know that like you got many responses from that interview, I can't even tell you what Jenny, my daughter and I received on social media from people all over the country, the world, actually. I mean, everybody watches you, Harvey. Your audience is huge. And I know why, because you do an interview that's so well-researched based on what is in your heart. To have that come together in one interview is really magical and overwhelming. So thank you for the opportunity of coming back to you again. By the way, you are my daughter's uncle, Harvey, now. That's right. If you're my <laughs> brother, I'm her uncle. Well, thank you for those beautiful words, Tony. Believe me, I do feel blessed at this moment to have you here and to make such a meaningful friend. You've been such an important person in my life, probably more than you realize. Now, as you know, Tony, I received a lot of questions and comments from your fans after the interview. And there was one common theme that kept running through those comments, and it was this. With all the fame and success you've had over the last 60 years, how have you managed to remain so grounded, so down to earth, and so humble? Well, that's a great compliment. I didn't realize that that's, that's what I'm, I didn't even realize that that's what's coming out of me to them. So it's a difficult, I just, I'm just me. I don't know. It's not calculated or figured out. So it's hard for me to really answer that question. The only thing I can think of to be at least direct, give a direct answer is that humble to me is the most important part of a career. I, I believe that this is a gift and that gift should be respected as a gift that's 
all literally supernatural because nobody who never went to high school only went to the eighth grade could end up doing what I've done, you know, working for eight presidents, tasting the foods of 33 different cultures, having the most incredible suites at hotels that most people have to be billionaires to even stay in, to have limousines pick you up at the airport. That is not something that you brag about. That is something that you are humbled by. And as every time something like that would happen to me, I would literally put my hands in prayer position and thank the Lord. So humble comes from the gifts that you and the audiences have given me. That dream on my rooftop in New York City where I sang those doo-wop songs when I was a kid came true. How could you not be humbled by that? I think what made you humble is the gratitude you have. Absolutely. Uh, the gratitude I have to them, to those audiences. You know, I walk out on the stage sometimes. I'm now 78, Harvey. And at my age, sometimes I say, you know what? I think I'm going to call it a day. You know, 62 years is about the right thing to do. You know, then I walk out on stage and those applause and those faces and those smiles and those people who come back shaking backstage to a meet and greet or give me a hug or say, you don't know, my husband just passed away and he loved you. He loved your music. I just want you to know he's looking down from heaven. All this kind of stuff that happens to one because of what I do. Gratitude is not even the proper word to use. Grateful Yes, it's okay, but there is no word designed yet to describe the emotion that happens to you when you've been in these shoes. So that means you're not going to retire just yet, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. As long as I keep going out there. But, you know, it gets tiring. It's like I told you on the phone, Harvey. It's not the shows. It's the traveling. You know, today it's times... You know, you're delayed four hours at the airport. It's canceled at 10 o'clock at night. You check into the room. You got to get up at six. You, you didn't make sound check because the flight wasn't on time. All of that in modern day times is difficult. It's not like it used to be. It used to be a nonstop flight everywhere. Everywhere, basically. Not You didn't have to stop and then wait four hours for the next connecting flight. And it seemed like Traveling seemed easier. Maybe the population was less. Maybe I was younger. I don't know, but it is taxing. It is literally, literally taxing. So when I think, I say, I think about re retiring, I think what I'm talking about is retiring from flying. <laughs> you know? That makes sense. I totally get that. Tony, I want to take you back to the early years for a moment. When you were an executive at CBS Records, Many people may not know that you were the first one to sign Barry Manilow to a record deal. How did that happen? Well, he came into my office. My immediate boss, vice president of CBS at that time, I was general manager of the company at the time, uh, Neil Anderson. He was friends with Neil Anderson, the, the guy that was above me, my boss. It was Neil and then Clive Davis. And uh, he said, hey, my friend of mine is working at a place called... Uh, Le Drugstore. Le Drugstore? Yeah, he goes to the baths and works at the baths with Bette Midler, it's a, a young artist no one ever heard of. Why don't you check him out? So I said, well, why don't you just invite him into the office? So he comes into the office, Barry does. Tall, grasshopper-like, thin kid, handsome, sits at the piano, plays me Bach and Beethoven, and then plays me some songs he wrote. And what impressed me about him was not necessarily his writing at the time, but it was his sound of his voice. I said to myself, you know, what makes a star is the actual being able to recognize their voice on the radio. And every time you hear it, when you hear Sinatra, you know it's Sinatra. When you hear Aretha Franklin, you know it's Aretha. When you hear Dean Martin, you know definitely it's Dean Martin. Well, Barry had that quality in his voice. And so I went into the studio and I recorded Barry. And here's the crazy part of that recording session. I wouldn't have met Telma Hopkins and Joyce Vincent, who became Dawn, if I didn't record Barry. So listen here. Here I am recording this new artist 
to his first time in the studio, teaching him how to approach the microphone like Carol King taught me when I was a kid, teaching him this, the, the studio world, the world of earphones and singing on a microphone is a whole other technique. And at the same time, I'm actually meeting my future with Telma and Joyce because I was using them as background singers. Who would have ever thought that in that moment, a major megastar in Barry Manilow was to be born, a group called Tony Orlando and Dawn was to be born out of that one four hour recording session. None of us were known, no one knew who we were, and look what God has blessed us with. Wow, that's just amazing. I, I read that you helped Barry Manilow write his song, Could It Be Magic? But you never got credit for that. Why not? Well, I got credit for it when it was released. If you look at the first record that was released, it did it did shows that I not only wrote it with him, but I, but I published it. Later on, we had a little difficulty because it wasn't named, my name disappeared on all those records afterwards. So, you know, what are you going to do? You know, what can I say? <laughs> I think what you're trying to say is there's a lot of money you never got. That's true. That's the truth. I mean, you know, there's a, a lot of law stuff in between then and now that I have not even pursued anymore. Barry knows the truth. I know the truth and God knows the truth. So if you listen to the first record, which was, by the way, the reason why the record was entitled as an artist, Featherbed, was because when I took Barry to be signed at Bell Records, remember, when I took him to be signed at Bell, I had Candida and Knock Three Times. I had some clout at that label. And so I brought Barry in, and the Larry Utah, who was the president of the record company, said, nobody with the name Barry is ever going to become a star. we got to drop the name Barry, just like you did with Tony Orlando. You're Dawn... Not Tony Orlando and Dawn yet. You're Dawn. So let's just find a name, a group. Uh, so I lived at the time on Featherbed Lane in the Bronx. So I went to Barry and I said, Barry, would you mind if we just call this record for now the a fake group called Featherbed just to get started? And I'll put it on the bottom featuring Barry Manilow. And I told them what Larry Utah said. We'll show you how wrong Larry Utah was because, of course, Barry became a megastar. And so the thing that I pride myself most in was recognizing his talent, working with him in the studio, helping him become the artist he was, producing his first two records released ever. And then it got, like the record business has some sad sides to it. There was a sad side to the story between Barry and I, which I really don't want to get into because it's all legal questions and we don't need to hear it. But the truth of the matter is, the record I recorded with him, with Featherbed, Barry Mel, is... My lyric, my title, my my words, and of that came out in let's see, nineteen seventy one or 70, 71. It wasn't until two or three years later that the ballad version, which was changed by him, in the verses and the meaning, he kept the choruses and the lyric in the chorus, but he changed them. The original. Uh, now remember, he wrote this song with his co-writer, but the lyric. The label didn't want that lyric at the time because they felt that it wasn't pop, top 40 enough. It wasn't pop pop enough. So I was trying to make him pop to keep him on the label because they were ready to dismiss Barry, you know, after the first record. So I went in and did a top 40 type record, unlike this very classical, beautiful record he eventually did record. But it's one of those things I didn't get credit later. Uh, we addressed it legally. It never got solved. And all I can do is I leave it up to his heart, and he knows what really happened. I don't hold any grudges towards him. And I even told him when I saw him at a, at a performance, I said, Barry, you know the one thing I know? I know that I was right about your career. That I do know. That's for sure. Do you think that your experience as a record company executive helped you as an entertainer from a business standpoint? Definitely. You know, I didn't know before that time, Harvey, that there was a creation of a word called show business. So there's the show part, there's the business part. Whoever came up with those two words and put them together was very right on the money. 
because very often artists do not think about the business side. They only think about the show side. What is the show side? The performance they do live on stage, the writing of their songs, the production of the record, but they forget there's contracts, there's legalities, there's, there's who owns what, how your family's gonna receive it when you're long gone. There's all kinds of dynamics that business is as important as how good you are in the studio or how good you are. You, a lot of times, artists don't want to know about it. Oh, I'll give it to my lawyer. Or I'll give it to my uh, manager. And they get burned. They get burned. And I was burned myself. You know, I had a person who was dealing with my, you being a lawyer, I'll appreciate this, dealing with my accounting that ended up literally stealing millions of dollars from me, unbeknownst to me. The same thing happened to Billy Joel. He lost, I don't know, $40 million to a brother-in-law who was his accountant, I, I read that. So sometimes we get so locked into our creative side, we forget our business side. So that job that you just mentioned, working for Clive, wow, was that an education. Wow, did I understand the difference between the show and the business. And the business in the end, Harvey, is more important than anything because that is what goes to your children. That is what goes to your future of your family. Well, I hope you're taking good care of my niece. Oh, I'm taking good care of my, my daughter, definitely your niece. But that's the truth. The truth is behind that desk, and here's another thing that I learned behind the desk, Harvey. You know, when a kid comes in, a young person came in and played me a song that they wrote, including Barry Manilow, by the way, I had to critique that song. And sometimes I have to turn it down or, or not sign that young person to a contract. But I would always tell them, I said, you know, it's not because you're not talented. It's because you're not fitting where the direction of our label is going or our company is going. There is a label out there for you. An example is Barry Manilow. At the time, the record business was really looking into a little bit towards heavy metal. They were going towards more of the heavy metal bands in the early 70s, very much so. So Barry was more of a pop artist, okay? He, he even was a jazz guy, a very good jazz guy, a good jazz man for sure. It's a musician first, a range of musician. So I knew that Barry fit on that label. At the time, it was Bell Records became Arista Records. But if I had to turn Barry down, it would be because I couldn't find the right label for him, not that he wasn't talented. So very often, I would have to tell that artist, that's not your talent. It's where I can fit you. Because they'll walk out the doors with their heads down thinking they didn't, they're didn't, not good. I made sure that they realize that they are good, but they have to find themselves the perfect fit. Now, Tony, as you know, this year is the 50th anniversary of your signature song, Tie a Yellow Ribbon Around the Old Oak Tree. When you were here last time, we talked about the significance of that song, especially for veterans. My question to you now is, when did you realize that the song was going to become not just a hit song, but your signature song? You know, I didn't realize it until I did let me see, until the television show. When the television show came on, remember, we went from being Dawn featuring Tony Orlando to Tony Orlando and Dawn. When we had to find a theme song for that show, it was obvious it had to be Yellow Ribbon. So we played it like a theme song, but, you know, like, almost like the Tonight Show. So the Tonight Show went, ba da ba ba da ba da ba da da ba da right? My show went, we did Yellow Ribbon in that same feel. So it was da ba da 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 ba da ba 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 da ba da ba. But once we did that, I said, oh my God, this is my Mac the Knife. Oh my gosh. And it was Bobby Darren himself who said, this is your Mac the Knife, Tony. This is your signature song. And when Bobby told me that, that's when I knew it began, what it became. Well, I'm glad you mentioned your TV show. In your first interview, you said there were two hilarious moments on your show. We talked about the Phyllis Diller incident. And I'm going to take a guess here that the other funniest moment 
was the Ruth Buzzy and Danny Thomas in the butcher shop skit? Let me tell you something, Ari. To this day, I look back on that moment. This genius, Ruth Buzzy, this comedic genius, and this soulful woman, who to this day has got the most beautiful heart. I'd love for you to interview her. She's amazing. She went on that set, literally made that sketch happen because there really was nothing in writing for her. The producer said, let her go. So all I had was, I'm going into this butcher shop. I meet a girl who's a fan and she's off and running. I had no dialogue. I had to ad lib off of her. And all I kept saying to myself during this hilarious time, as she's jumping on my body and screaming and yelling and doing all the things as she thought a fan would be doing, it became, when we walked out of that studio, Danny Thomas turned to me and said, I have never, and the producers of the show agreed, we have never seen someone nail, nail hilariousness like Ruth Buzzy did on her own. It was just one laugh after the next. And if you watch that tape, she had the whereabouts in her head when she jumped up and scissored my waist. You know, she said and fell back. She had the wherewithal to know to grab her dress so that her skirt so that it wouldn't fall and ruin the sketch. Because she knew if that dress went back to her hips, they wouldn't use what she just did. She had to, she got that aware of where her skirt was and lifts it up towards her knees to stay dressed and finish that sketch. This woman, not only the nicest Harvey I've ever worked with, not only the nicest, but the most brilliant, ingenious comedian ever, ever. And Lucille Ball even told me that. Lucy herself said, hey, Ruth Buzzy, she's in a class all by herself. That's really quite a tribute. So I just want people to know the box set of the Tony Orlando and Don TV show does contain both the Phyllis Diller incident. I call it an incident for obvious reasons and the Ruth Buzzy skit. So don't miss it. Now, it's also Tony, on YouTube. You can get it on YouTube also. Tony, when you were on the show last time, I told you that my favorite guest on your TV show was your grandmother, your mamita. Yeah. And I got so emotional, I forgot to ask you, who was your favorite guest in those four seasons? It's hard. They were all so great. It's very difficult. But I think my favorite guest was like you, my grandmother. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why, Harvey. That You should pick up with that just as an indication of your heart, Harvey. This is what you're about. You're all heart. And you recognize that whenever you see something, that's what strikes you the most, is the heart of something. Well, you want me to tell you why? Yeah. Because I think that deep down, we all want our parents and our grandparents to be proud of us. And when I saw the look on your face, when you introduced your mamita to the world, you were so proud that you made her proud of you, that it made us all love you so much. Thank you for that. You know, Harvey, I'll tell you something about that moment. The night before she came on the air, the rocking chair that she was sitting on in that moment on my TV show, she was sitting on that rocking chair in my home. That rocking chair came from my house. And what happened was the night before the show, I asked her these questions that you saw me ask her on the show. She was so wonderful. I said, mamita, which means little grandmother in Spanish, mamita, Will you be okay coming on the show tomorrow? I agree. Oh, yes, yeah, I'll go on the show with you. I will go on with you, Tony. Yes, indeed. I said, okay. So I called Freddie Silverman and I said, Freddie, can I have 15 minutes with my grandmother before we start the show and tape it? He goes, why? I said, I, I want I, I think it'd be a great moment on the show. He goes, Tony. Do you know how much 15 minutes on a network television show can cost if it doesn't work? I said, I'll tell you what, if it doesn't work, don't pay me for the, however long you have me until I pay you back whatever it is I wish to buy. He said, you're willing to do that? I said, yeah. 
I think this moment's going to become special. So I get the wardrobe to give her her hairdo. She gets makeup on. I bring out the, uh, the, the green chair. They give her a green dress to sit in. She looks like an angel. She sits down and she just answers my questions. And guess what, Harvey? Not only did it become the number one viewership response of all of the years I was on television, but right after that TV show aired, I go to the White House for the first time to meet then President Ford and Mrs. Ford and perform at the White House. I'm on the line, right? I'm heading towards the President of the United States. I come upon Shirley Temple is the ambassador to the, whole, to the White House at the time. She said, Mr. President, this is Mr. and Mrs. Tony Orlando. And Mrs. Ford goes, oh my God, how's Mamita? <laughs> In the White House. And the president goes, oh, we love your grandmother. She was so what? I said, wait a minute. Wait a second. You remembered my grandmother's name? The president? She goes, oh, please, after we leave here, can we call her? And they called my grandmother. The president of the United States calls my grandmother and says, hello, mamita. This is President Ford. Oh, it's an honor to meet you. It's such a pleasure to meet you, Mr. President. You know, it was amazing. The response from the audience, typical of you, of all the shows that you picked to talk about, typical of you to find the number one and the biggest heart of the whole four years I was on television. Man, you're one of a kind, Harvey. You're one of a kind. Well, thank you for that. But to me, the real message in that story you just told us is how wrong these studio executives are. Fred Silverman, who is the head of a major network, didn't get what you were trying to do until you did it. That's actually well, shocking. Well, he would he got it because he agreed to do it. But the, but his concern was. It wasn't in the script. What happens if we don't fit it in? That's a loss of time and money. That's a lot of money to do 15 minutes of, of studio time in a, in a network situation. So he let me go on so many different ways, Freddie. As a matter of fact, it was Freddie Silverman who came up with the name Tony Orlando and Dawn. And it was Freddie Silverman who had the guts to put on a multiracial group for the first time in the history of television, that was that was almost as important. That's more important than the success of the show, is that he at a time when Martin Luther King had just recently been shot and killed, when we were in the middle of the all of the family seasons, which you know what that was about, and he still had the guts to put on three kids who never even did a high school play to go out and do sketches with Jackie Gleason and all these great artists and go out on stage and do that and be the first to do it, he is to be respected and thanks for that. Because that changed television. That literally changed it to think that not only were we the first multiracial group, Harvey, we were the first singing group to ever have their own primetime show. It was a remarkable show. We certainly talked about that last time. And for all of the reasons you've mentioned, when people talk about your show now, Tony, especially the last two seasons, many people feel there was too much comedy and not enough music in those last two seasons. Do you agree with that? I agree with you. I was very upset by that. They changed the name of the show. And I'll tell you what happened. I still don't understand it to this day. I don't know because we were doing very well just as where we were. But a new president came in. When Freddie left to go to ABC, Freddie Silverman, a new president came in. So that Wednesday night, they wanted us to go up against Happy Days, which was this phenomenal hit show that was historically phenomenal in terms of numbers. But they thought that our demographic could fight that show. So they put us on, on the night of, of Happy Days. So the producer said, we have to change the show. We have to be more like Saturday Night Live. We have to have more like comedy sketches. And it was the death of the show. In fact, they changed the name to the Rainbow Hour, which I had a lot to do with, but that didn't even work. You know, I was, I was trying to make it uh, within the structure of disco and made the Yellow Ribbon theme sound like a disco record. It was just a big giant mistake. And 
we suffered by it because that's why we got canceled. That last two years, the rainbow hour was a definite mistake. Yes, because I think they lost sight of the fact that what we fell in love with well, first and foremost was the music. You know, this magical sound that the three of you created in all those hit songs. But I will tell you this, Tony, we've never talked about this on the phone, but, you know, I had Alan Paul here from the Manhattan Transfer and we had Tony Tennille here. Both of them had variety shows, the Manhattan Transfer and the Captain and Tennille. And they both told me that having variety shows and being pressured to do comedy when what they really were all about was the music was very, very bad for them. Tony Tennille, they stopped after one season and the Manhattan Transfer only did four weeks for a summer replacement for Sonny and Cher and they didn't continue. You guys had the guts to stay on for four years. That says a lot. Yeah, you know, it does say a lot, especially, you know, when we went on, there was a little contest going on. Uh, in the summer, it was Bobby Gentry, the Hudson Brothers and, my, and our group. And Freddie said, whoever gets the highest ratings will get a, a, sh a network show coming in uh, September, or October, whenever. And instead of doing the full 26, we did the first 12 in that replacement year. So we won the ratings. We had 35 million people watch that show every single week. Imagine that 35 share and 36 share of all of the people in this country were watching that show. In the summer. In the summer. And then continuing on for the next two years when we went on network completely. So I look back on it now and I think mistakes are made sometimes without realizing it. You know, trying too hard sometimes. I think the station, the network, everybody was so frightened by this enormous hit called Happy Days. I mean, it was gigantic. It was getting like a 70 share. It was getting like the whole country was watching that show. So out of a panic situation, we suffered. Because if we would have just stayed where we were and been to do what we do best, which is, you're right, the music. The comedy was great. By the way, I think Telma and Joyce, when they did the Lou Effie and Maureen sketches, were absolutely incredible actresses for two young women who never acted a day in their life. And it turned out to be true for Telma. She's the longest running sitcom actress in history. She yeah. hasn't been off the air since 1973. It's unbelievable. There's a wonderful skit in the Carol Burnett show where Carol, Vicki Lawrence, and Harvey Korman portray Tony Orlando and Dawn in a song called Tie Your Pajamas Round the Old White Pine. And then you, Telma, and Joyce came out and surprised them at the end of the number. Whose idea was it to do that skit? It was mine. It was mine. I, I'll tell you what happened. I heard they were going to do this. So we went over. Our studio and her studio were literally side by side. Our summer show started in Carol's original studio. They moved her over to the bigger studio. So I heard that they were doing a Tallahassee, Tony and Tallahassee, something, an imitation of us. So I went over and I saw them rehearsing it. So I go back and I say, tell them and Joyce, listen, let's just walk on. What are they going to do? They're going to yell at us? So they yell at us. Let's just walk out and see what happens. Well, we, they didn't know we were going to do it, Harvey. The, the producers, the directors, the audience, no one. Carol, no one. You know how gutsy that was for me to walk on Carol Burnett's stage in the middle of a sketch? My God, I would never do that today, right? But I'm I'm freewheeling back then. So we walk on stage, and I could see by the reaction of the when I say there was a scream, the scream, if you were in that studio, it rumbled, and Carol knew it was gold. I could see it in her eyes, you know. She knew right away, uh-oh, this is going to be gold. And when I grabbed Harvey's mustache and pulled it off, and you know, we never said a word. The three of us never said a word. We just gave him a take, a look, and then I grabbed Harvey's mustache and threw it to the ground. When I tell you that when that sketch was over, the people in that television studio wouldn't stop applauding and laughing. And then what happened after we went off the air and Carol started telling them how pissed off she was that we walked on stage because she was doing it comedically. How dare they walk out here on Carol? It got more laughs 
We only wish we had taped that because she's brilliant, Carol, like Ruth, a genius. And that was one of the funniest and most happiest moments we ever did on, on television, the girls and I. And honored, by the way, that they kept it. Well, not only did they keep it, it's one of the bonus features on the Tony Orlando and Don TV show box set. And I think once you get the likes of Carol Burnett doing a parody of you, you've become immortalized. I think you're right. I think that was a major part of, of if there's a being immortalized, uh, it applies to me. I don't know about that, but if it is, she had a lot to do with it, let me tell you, because that and the other thing with the Dean Martin shows, the Dean Martin roasts, when I look back on them now and I see who was on the panel of those shows, and I was there for the roasting of Dean himself and also Muhammad Ali roast. When I think that I was part of that group, look at that's one legend after the next, after the next coming out of that stage. That's when I, I realized, boy, Tony, your rooftop dream went a long way. What do you think of the fact that there are no more variety shows on TV anymore? I think they, uh, like all things, they transition and, and evolve into what was to what is now. So what is now? Now it's the masked singer. Now the masked singer is variety show, takes the place of the variety show. American Idol takes the place of the variety show. It has all the same elements, music, comedy, audience participation of all variety shows. So it just wearing a different pair of pants, a different shirt, but basically it fits the same genre. The only difference is we were doing what was called basically vaudevillian comedy. It was a more vaudevillian type of approach to each sketch. And that's gone. That's gone. The only people that do it, and I can't call it vaudevillian, is to do sketch is Saturday Night Live. They're doing sketches like we used to. That's the only one left. And it's because it's politics and contemporary takeoff on comedy of what's happening during our time. But uh, it, it's still there. It's just un wearing a different shirt. Would you ever consider being a judge on one of those shows like The Voice or American Idol? Oh, sure. I'd be a good one, too. You know I what, Arnie? Mean? I'd be a good one. Because of all the years of experience, and I say that not in a cocky way, that would be a very good position for me because I care about young people starting out. I would be able to give them the, the right advice, I think, and I think I could zero in and being at that I had that experience behind the desk and writing and signing people like Barry Manilow and representing James Taylor, his music. I think that would apply. Yeah, I would have fun doing that. Yeah, I'm surprised you haven't been asked yet. So I think I'm going to have to go on a little mission. <laughs> Are you want to manage me? Are you want to manage me, Harvey? Would I love to do that. Now, I'm sure you're not going to be surprised, Tony. The number one question I got from your fans, and I know you've answered it a million times, so I hope you won't be upset. But the number one question is, why did Tony Orlando and Don break up? Well, I had a breakdown. When Freddie died, I broke. When Freddie Prince died, I broke. I watched this 22-year-old genius like a young brother to me, and he was only in the business for three years. Three years. And we were the only ones in Hollywood who knew what a Hurricane Pollo is. He was a Hungarian, I'm a Greek Rican. We had that New York grow up together. We, our families were the same. We could speak Spanish to each other. And when I saw Freddie in the hospital, in the condition that he was in, and then finally I was there for the, the last pair of lips to kiss his lips were mine. Yeah. And it, I never saw anyone die before. And right in front of my eyes, they pulled the plug on him. And he went from a beautiful pink skin to absolutely the whitest you've ever seen anything you know, change like that. That I broke, I broke. And so when I broke, I quit the industry for, I thought forever. And I, I just left and the group broke up. 
And for a year, I did nothing. I was hospitalized. I was going through therapy. I, there was a lot going on in Tony's life because of that terrible time. And Telma and Joyce, actually, it worked out great for them because Telma went on to Roots, then Bosom Buddies, then Give Me a Break, then Urkel and Family Matters. She was Aunt Rachel. And on, half and half and on and on and on. And still she's on Dead to Me. She's on that show as a regular. So if it wasn't for the fact that we broke up, who knows what career Telma would have had? Who knows where Joyce would have gone? Joyce ended up doing jingles and commercials and representing Diana Ross and the Supremes to this day. Her next door neighbors and friends and keeps their music alive and well as, as a Supreme. So it all worked out right for us but the only reason we broke up wasn't because of anything between us because to this day they are my sisters to this day we talk to each other to this day we help each other in fact we not long ago went on a reunion tour for the fun of it and had a ball doing it and sold out you know twenty thousand seat arenas because of it but no the 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 bonding that has gone on since 1971, with me and Telma and Joyce, is is so tight. There's no there's no way you could take the glue out of that picture. It's forever, and the music is forever too. Now you mentioned, of course, the tragedy of Freddie Prince. Given your very close relationship with Freddie Prince, a lot of your fans want to know whether you remained close with his son, Freddie Prince Jr. You know, it's the saddest thing. Freddie Jr. had his first birthday at my home in Brentwood. When Freddie died, I promised Freddie with his eyes closed in the hospital, like there were bandages on his head from his wounds, that I would watch over his son. My, his mother moved Freddie to Albuquerque. His mother told me that she really wanted nobody to continually talk about Freddie have Freddie grow up with the environment of, you know, your father died, what happened. She wanted him to have a normal life. She was a good mom. So she kept him away from me and she did the right thing for him. So all the years went by. So finally, uh, I went to a, an award show, I forgot what it was, and I wrote him a note and I got no response. And I talked to jo George Lopez about it. And George said, you know what, Tony? Freddie doesn't want to go there anymore. That was his opinion. And I respected that. I understand that. You know, it's about, he never even met his dad. He never had a day with his dad. His dad was was just someone that they talk about to him every time he walks into a studio in an interview. If I were him, I would want no part of that anymore. Freddie Prince Jr. is Freddie Prince Jr. in his own right. A great actor and a wonderful young man. And that's that's best that he didn't have to deal with all the crap that comes with that terrible day. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, everyone knows how much I loved your book, Halfway to Paradise, which I highly recommend to all our viewers. It really is one of the most insightful and moving celebrity memoirs I've ever read. My question to you, Tony, is would you like to see your book, The Story of Your Life, made into a movie? I've been asked that a few times, Harvey, to be honest with you, it would be wonderful. I think it has a great story to it. When I step back and look at myself as third person, look at myself as though I was the executive to managing this artist called Tony Orlando, or, and I saw how lush the story is from my sister, Rhonda, who suffered with cerebral palsy and had an IQ of about an eight month old baby till the day she died and my participation and having her in my arms during seizures and, and, and me continuing on with my dream. Then finding these two wonderfully great background singers and my time with Barry, my time with Clive Davis, this, this kind of kid that only saw the eighth grade and ended up with nine presidents and ended up on Broadway walking the wire and, and, and getting an accolade uh, for his job as an actor on Broadway. And this it's not a rags to riches story as much as it is a story about 
racial equality, about the fact that we had to deal with, we, CBS didn't know whether we were going to be accepted as this Puerto Rican black group on primetime television. We didn't know if we were going to get a KKK letter or what. We didn't know crosses were going to come around our houses with burning crosses. We didn't know what was going to happen. All of that combined with the joy of making it and the joy of making the music we made and the joy of making that song, Yellow Ribbon, a theme song, a symbolic song for the uh, homecoming of our veterans who serve in the wars that were on during the time of my success. All of that makes for a great dramatic film, musical, play. And we do have a Broadway play written. The book is written. The music is written. It's not just the hits. It's 15 brand new songs that I wrote with Michael Lamarty and my brother David. Those uh, is in action right now to go on Broadway. Broadway, as you know, is a unique animal. You never know where it's going to go. You know, Cher had her show on. It didn't go anywhere. You'd be surprised. You'd think, wow, that's going to be a big hit. And it wasn't a big hit. Neil Diamond's show right now is a very successful show, Beautiful Noise on Broadway. And I'm happy to hear that for him. He deserves that. So there will come a time when that show will either make it on Broadway or that story will make it into a film. I think it's worth doing. I do I, too. I say that as a person looking at me, but it's not me. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, I think there's so much to the story. You know, you were a, a teen idol. Then you had to deal with the British invasion and reinventing yourself as an executive. And then you had this kind of very accidental return to show business. You've talked about the very important ethnic mix that happened with Tony Orlando and Don on television. You have the relationship with Freddie Prinze, your own emotional journey, your experiences as kind of a junior legend. I mean, you were embraced by Dean Martin and Sammy Davis Jr. and, and Jerry Lewis. And a lot of these big, big stars saw you as somebody they could mentor. There, there is every ingredient there for an amazing miniseries, a Broadway show. I think it's going to happen, Tony, and I want to come to the premiere. You know something? I'm gonna you, you're gonna come and sell this stuff for me. You're gonna come and come to the studios and say, I have an idea, and here's why. You you put it together so well, Harvey. Thank you very much. I have never been so embraced by anybody in this business other than you like this, really. Well, it was about time. Now, the other thing we didn't talk about last time you were here was your very popular radio show on WABC Music Radio. Can you just tell us a bit about that? Yeah, it's a phenomenal thing that's happened, really. I did a favor for the person who owns that station, who I've known many years. His name is John Katsimatidis. He is a billionaire. He's Greek. I did the Greek parade. Uh, I was the uh, grand marshal for the Greek parade in New York, and he was right next to me. And I told him how proud he made my father, and he started to cry. And so he calls me. We became friends, like we became friends. And he calls me one day, and he says, "Say, hey, Tony, during the pandemic, you're not working. Would you do me a favor? I need to fill two hours of music on Saturdays. Would you mind doing that? Would you ever consider doing that? I said, I'll do anything you want, John. Whatever you want me to do. It would be like you calling me and saying, hey, you want to host, co-host a show with me? So I said, sure. Never thinking it's going to become anything other than a favor back to him. Well, I go on and I decided I'm not a disc jockey. I can't sit here and just play records. It's just not me. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a science and an art to itself. I said, I, I'm going to do a kind of mini documentaries. I'm, I'm going to do a two hour show that has some meat, some history, some stories about who the performer was, where I was with them at the time of the recording. And the show took off, Harvey. It took off to a degree where we're number one in our ratings and our time slot. We're number seven streaming worldwide. We're number one in New York on all platforms at that time. That's AM, FM, internet, social media. We've, it's gone through the roof. And I've enjoyed every minute of it. One of the great shows I did was a four-hour show 
with Clive Davis. Nobody gets four hours with Clive Davis. And I get through every single act, every story, everything I could get from him. The show got enormous ratings. Then I had Garth Brooks on. You see, this is a Garth Brooks hat, who's a real good friend of mine. And I have great admiration for him as a talent. I think he's extraordinary. He came on with his wife, Tricia. Then Adam Sandler came on. Then Lionel Richie came on. And it, you, I'm sitting there going, what? All these wonderful people coming on the show? And the show has been very successful. So if anybody out there not living in New York, you can stream it. Just go to WA, musicradiowabc.com. Musicradiowabc.com. The time on the Eastern time is 10 o'clock. So figure it out where it is in Central time and Pacific time in your own area. That's it. Well, we have the logo for the radio show on my background screen throughout this interview so that people can see that. Thank it is a that. hugely successful radio show. Tony is an amazing interviewer. There's a very good reason why all of those big names agree to go on your show. It's because you're really good, Tony, and I hope you know that. Thank you. I'm a, I learned something about interviewing. You have an art to interview that I don't have yet. And the reason, I'll explain why. When I do these shows, I pre-record every show because I'm on the road. So what do I do with my interviews? I edit my interviews. I make sure that I don't talk too much, that I don't talk over the guests, because I've been an interviewee for 62 years. I've never been an interviewer. I never realized, Harvey, I swear to you, I never realized the art form of an interviewer. Oh, other art form. And it's very, very uh, sensitive to be able to go from the interviewee to the interviewer because you have the tendency to go, well, I remember what I recorded. Now it becomes I. It's not about I when you, like, you don't talk about, you. look at you now. You're listening to every word I say. Your head is bobbing, your eyes are open, you're listening, and you haven't said one word to me while I speak. That is the art form I have not learned yet. I'm learning it. I'm getting there. But I'll be honest with you, I'm nowhere near close to what you are. Well, I think you do an amazing job. It's a wonderful way to spend a Saturday night. Well, Tony, in our remaining moments, I've been thinking about what I could ask you about your career that could kind of be like a metaphor for your life. And I thought of this. It occurred to me that when you appeared on Broadway in Barnum, you had to walk a tightrope every night and you never fell, not even once. I don't know if this question makes any sense to you, but was there an emotional significance to you or any symbolism for you of walking that tightrope in terms of your own life? Absolutely. You see, this is why I say you're great. You see, this is not just me sucking up to somebody. Let me tell you something. You're the first and only person that ever realized that that's why I even walked the wire. That is why I took that show. I took that show because prior to that, people knew about my story with Freddie. People knew that I indulged in some self-destructive ways. I wanted people to know that only a sober person who doesn't do drugs, who doesn't drink, can get on a wire and walk 33 feet across the stage no handles, no wires, no nothing, just your feet and your commitment to walking towards that girl who is playing your wife and going straight. And I said, if I can do that every night, no one will ever, ever, ever think that I am not within myself, capable, clear-headed, and, and able to be in a, in, a, in a sense of balance of life. When you walk up to a tightrope, it's all about balance, right? It's all about being able to stay off, falling off that rope. That was the most important moment. It wasn't even being on Broadway. It was the fact that I could walk that rope. And when I made that walk across the opening night, the cast knew it. The cast, when that first act closed and the curtain closed, the loudest applause I heard was from the cast because they knew what that walk meant to me. And on that opening night, with nerves and everything going like this, and my mother sitting out there with her hands over her eyes, thinking it's going to fall off that wire. I mean, man, I don't want to see it happen. And I'm walking across that wire. I felt like I was skating on ice. 
It was the easiest walk I've ever done in my life. And it was from that moment on, I realized that walk was symbolic of the rest of my life to come. Stay balanced, stay in touch with yourself. Don't walk off outside of that wire and commit yourself to a goal. I think that you were healed in the exercise of doing that and you have become a healer. Do you realize that? Well, no, I don't realize it, but thank you, Harvey, thank you. Well, thank before we close the show, is there anything that you want to say, Tony, to all the fans who followed your career all these years and who love you and love your music so much? Well, you know, simplicity is genius. I learned that from Ray Charles. One day he was playing the piano and singing, and I said, my God, Ray, you made that sound so simple. He said, Tony, it's easier to play something simple. It's more difficult to make something simple than it is to try to make something complicated, because simple is real, okay? So the simple fact is, is that what you have blessed me with with this interview, what the audiences have blessed me with for 62 years, there are no words to express the healing, the love, the joy. The audiences have been the pistons to my engine. They keep me going. At 78, they keep me alive. I can lay in my bed and feel sorry for myself. And the moment I go up on that stage, it's new life is breathed into me. You know, as much as I could complain about the flights and all that, it comes down to a gratefulness a thank you to everybody who's made this person's dreams come true. I know it sounds basic. The truth of the matter is, Ray's right. Simplicity is genius. Well, Tony, I'm having difficulty finding sufficient words to express my gratitude to you for once again taking the time to appear on our show. Thank you so much for your kindness, your generosity, your friendship, and your love, Tony. And that will be forever, Harvey. This bonding that's happened with you and I is something I do not take for granted. This is the first time I've ever really fallen in love with a man and, and said, you are my best friend from here on. You are, and you always will be a major part of my life every day. And every night when I lay my head on the pillow, I pray for friends and you'll be in my prayers every single night. Right back at you, Tony. I want to thank all the fans who took the time, not only to watch Tony's appearances on our show, but to send Tony and myself all those wonderful heartfelt messages of love and appreciation. We extend our love and gratitude to all of you. Thank you again, Tony. Harvey, you know, I must say there's a group called Tony's Troopers. They've been, they've been fans of mine. Some of them started be with me when they were seven and eight years old and still are with me. To those Tony Troopers, thank you, because they all responded to your show. Thank you to Tony's Troopers. Thank you for all the questions you sent me. And thank you, Tony, so very much once again for giving me this interview. Our very special guest has been the incomparable, one and only, legendary Tony Orlando. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver, my wonderful managers, Rick and Robin Marcelli in Hollywood, my entire team at the XPTV1 Network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thank you, Harvey. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.